this multiple choice question on complex numbers from the 2021 Spech Maths exam was the worst answered multiple choice question on the exam. We'll look at what made it so tricky for students, and we'll also have a look at two more uh, complex numbers questions, this one from 2020, and this one from 2017, which had a 1% success rate. 1%? That is out of this world. All right, so going back to this multi-choice question, uh, Z is a complex number, non-zero, and the square of Z is a real number. Then the possible values of arg Z are. Well, to start with, a real number, remember, lies on the real axis, uh, the x-axis there. And the key to this question is to remember Dumois' theorem. So if we say that Z is, for example, r cis theta, when we square that, we end up doubling the angle. So that tells us that the arg of z squared should be double the argument of z. Okay, so by doubling an angle, we need to end up somewhere on this real axis. So it could be, for example, that we start with somewhere um, with an argument of pi on 2. When we double it, we get an argument of pi. But that's not the only thing that could happen. For example, if the original argument was pi, when we double it, we get 2 pi, and that was also on the real axis. So we need to think about what are all the possible situations. Probably it's useful to do this algebraically. So if we start with um, what we know, which is that the argument of z squared has got to be a multiple of pi, okay? To be on the real axis, it must be a multiple of pi uh, because it's non-zero. Well, we know that that argument of z squared should be double the argument of z, as we've said, which tells us that the original argument of z uh, must be half of a multiple of pi. So for this question, setting it up algebraically like that really helps, and the solution just follows um, quite naturally when we set it up like that. And if we look at the most popular incorrect answers, it was actually C and D here. So indicating students realized that pi on 2 was an option, um, but sort of finding it hard to, to find how all the other options came together. So looking at it algebraically like this, um, all the other options just sort of come out quite naturally. All right, so let's have a look at another question. Uh, and this one is about sketching a ray and then writing down a, fu uh, a function that describes the ray. So to start with, I mean, this is part D. So earlier in the question, we were given the complex numbers U and V. And we need u here, which is negative 2 minus i. So part 1 was to sketch the ray. Um, and so we're starting from the point negative 2 comma negative 1. And we're going uh, pi on 4. So we're going like 45 degrees uh, from the positive x-axis. And um, the one that students found hard was actually describing this in Cartesian form. So, I mean, looking at that, we can probably tell it's got a gradient of 1. And it's not too hard, I guess, to get the Cartesian equation. But let's do it sort of from first principles, thinking about um, the argument as a tan function. So remember that the tan of theta is going to be y over x, and theta here is the argument. So here theta is pi and 4, so we've got tan of pi and 4, and for y divided by x here, we've got a translation because we're starting not from the origin, but from the point negative 2 comma negative 1. So we'll need here y minus negative 1, and on the denominator, x minus negative 2. So once we have that, uh, tan of pi and 4 is 1, and then we can rearrange that to get y equals x plus 1, which does agree with this graph we have here. Um, but where was the trick? Well, one of the tricks was um, students forgot the domain. Okay, So we definitely need a domain there. That ray only exists when x is larger than negative 2. Okay, not including because we don't include the endpoint there. So there's a message for you. Don't forget the domain if you're defining a ray in Cartesian form. All right, now on to this question from 2017, which really, um, you know, 99% of students were not able to get. Um, the equation of the line passing through the two roots of this quadratic can be expressed uh, in this form. Find B in terms of A. Well, to start with the roots, we, I mean, we were given those actually in an earlier part of the question. 
and those those roots um, were here, so those are two conjugates of each other. So we can easily sketch those. And what we're interested in is the line passing through those two roots. And we want to express it in this form uh, with the two moduluses. Now we might recognize this as going to give us a perpendicular bisector um, of a line segment joining A and B. So meaning that A and B have to be um, a sort of opposite sides, like reflected around this line. Okay, so they could be here on the real axis. I mean, they could be up here somewhere. They could be closer together, but they're going to be the same distance from the line. And they're going to be um, actually at, at the same height because this line is vertical. So this line segment here is going to be horizontal. So how can we express B in terms of A? Well, I mean, just looking at sort of this uh, diagram here, we can tell that actually um, the imaginary parts of both numbers are going to be equal, okay, because they have to be at the same height. And what can we say about the real parts? Well, they're going to be symmetrical around this line uh, x equals negative 2, or in other words, their average must be negative 2. Okay, so when we add the real parts together and divide by 2, we must get negative 2. So we can rearrange this a little bit. We want to find b in terms of a. So the real part of b, uh, just by rearranging this, is going to be negative 4 minus the real part of a. So, I mean, we've already got really there the imaginary part of b and the real part of b. So, I mean, we've sort of, we've answered the question in a way, but I guess we want to find b in terms of a. So how can we put those together? So b, of course, is uh, its real part plus its imaginary part times i. So just replacing um, these expressions here with what we had from up here, we get this expression here. And I think that would have got the mark, you know, because it's only a one mark question and it does define the complex number b. Um, but in the official solutions, um, we've been a little bit, they've been a little bit clever and just rearranged this. We can actually, um, if we put the parts of a together, we've got negative 4 minus the real part of a minus the imaginary part of a. So that thing there in the bracket is actually a conjugate. Okay, so we've got negative 4 minus um, a conjugate there. So don't expect another similar question to that, but I guess the um, the key concept is that this form is giving us a perpendicular bisector. So um, those points are going to be reflected in each other uh, about the line, this line through those two roots there. All right, hope that was helpful. 1%? That is out of this world.